Untamed. Five, four, three, two, one. The Platform. Welcome to the show, and it is a show. Martin Devlin, Lachlan Moore, iOS, it's only sport. That's what we do. We just talk sport three hours a day on the platform between one and four. And if you can't join us live, well then, this is the next best thing. A podcast highlights show of our program, including very special guest, Valtteri Bottas, the Finnish F1 driver. He has won at Melbourne GP this weekend. He won 219. There he's won 10 GPs in total. Building up to the big race across the ditch this coming Sunday. Super Rugby this weekend. Blues Crusaders, that's the marquee matchup. That's the pick of the bunch. Todd Blackadder, legendary Crusaders captain. Now, the last time the Crusaders were in the kind of hole that they are at the moment, Todd Blackadder was in charge of that team, and they won three in a row, 98, 99, 2000. What's his words of wisdom for a Crusaders side that are 0-4 and really struggling? Zahn Sullivan from the Blues as well on the programme. We caught up with Ryan Fox as well, who's struggling away on the PGA Tour this year. He's had three missed cuts. Absolutely brilliant. A bright spot was the hole-in-one 17th at TPC Sawgrass. But but why is the game just not coming together, and when does he feel that it will? Ryan Fox on the podcast. Greg Martin, former Wallaby fullback out of Brisbane. Plus, today in 1992, where were you and what were you doing? If you're of the age and stage, you were witnessing, watching, and lamenting one of the most crushing sports defeats in New Zealand history. Eden Park, it was the one-day semi-final. Danny Morrison was part of the Black Caps that day. Him <sighs> on the program as well. We start the show the same way every day. Tablets in hand, I say gather my flock. It is time for a sermon. I didn't want to talk about this, but I'm going to have to. I'm going to go into bat full of, full of trowel. Let's go to the mountaintop. We live in an amazing, amazing world, and it's wasted on the crappiest generation of just spoiled idiots. The Troll Mitchell's on-field expletive-laden interview. How bad was it, and did he in fact deserve a suspension? Yes, it was a poor look, but no, no way should he have copped a match ban as a result. Interviewed by radio on-field and immediately after the loss to Brisbane last Thursday night, the troll dropped, I don't know, four or more F-bombs, then said at the end of the interview something like, oh, I, I know that kids are listening and I, and, I, and I just don't care. First and foremost, it was a really bad look and he shouldn't have done it and he should have roundly apologised afterwards. But the overreaction to this and the calls from all and sundry, including a lot of past players, to come down as hard on him as what Lenu got is just idiotic. NRL CEO Andrew Abdo, for me, has got this one exactly right. A telling off, a tut-tut, a reminder, but most importantly, not succumbing to the social media squealers who thrive on being outraged on behalf of somebody else who they think should be outraged whether they are or not. What about the kids? What about the kids who are listening? He's a role model, blah, blah, blah. Listen, the game finished after 10 o'clock at night. If kids are listening to the radio at that time, how old are they? If they're not teenagers, I'd be asking mum and dad, well, what are they doing still up at night listening to the radio? And if they are teenagers, please, you should be more concerned about what they're seeing, downloading and watching on their screens and their phones. The F word is heard on news bulletins these days. That's how commonplace it is. Thinking that a young person is somehow going to be adversely affected or suffer some sort of late-in-life trauma as a result of this is just utter BS. Put some proper perspective on this, people. It was heat of the moment, end of the game, another poor performance and a loss. And what he was saying and how he was saying it is how adults talk at these times. It's how all of us fans, if you were fans of that club, would have been talking on the couch afterwards. So, no... He shouldn't have done it. And yes, he should never do it again. But in terms of importance in the sport, I just don't think it really is as big a deal as it's been made to be. There are plenty more things to do with rugby league that deserve worrying, screaming and shouting about than this. Devlin. What do you want? We want information. Information. You won't get it. The platform. Sports News headlines. And, I mean, I'm checking the calendar, mate. So it's not April the 1st. This Sam Whitelock story is legit. Well, to find legit. Well, Greg, Gregor Paul wrote it, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Okay, well, I believe Gregor. I'll read no the question. first um, couple of excerpts out of it. One of the great sporting comebacks may be on the cards later this year, as All Blacks coach Scott Robertson has made a play to persuade Sam Whitelock 
to return to New Zealand and resume his test career. Well, OK. Is that going to happen? I'm not too sure. The man who won hundreds of lineups for the All Blacks, who thundered into more rucks than anyone could possibly recall. Mate, produced, he won the turnover against Ireland. I was about to in say, produced us, that unforgettable turnover yes. at the end of that game against Ireland. Uh, he's potentially going to write a postscript to his, interne- uh, his incredible test career. Uh, he's considering returning to New Zealand. This is actually potentially happening after a compelling sales pitch from Robertson, who was recently in Europe and Japan. Would we want this to happen? Yep. Is it, a good sp- is it a good sign Absolutely. of the future, Absolutely. though? I don't, I don't care about the future. I care about the now when it comes to the All Blacks. I care about winning now. 505 on the text, people. Quickly, do you think it's a good idea, Sam, or not? Just quickly, and maybe we can expand on this in the Type 5. I think it, pr- it shows two things. One, that Scott Robertson's not pleased with the uh, leadership group that there will be for the All Blacks this year, and That's he wants one. to bring yep. someone in. And yep. two, he is in no way pleased with the locking stocks. Exactly right, mate. Exactly right. Anyway... Let's move on to some Blues news. Uh, veteran lock Patrick Tui Pilotu and captain of the Blues, he is Tui Pilotu. He'll return from a broken jaw to cap the side against the Crusaders at Eden Park on Saturday night. Just quickly, those heritage shirts that the Blues and the Crusaders are putting, they look quite funny. They look quite good. Money. I, love, I love them. Mate. This is one thing League have done really well is the heritage shirts. NRL clubs have uh, brilliant heritage jerseys that are always on sale. They're never out of stock. The, uh, the Super Rugby needs to do this, I think. I actually like the look of that Crusaders one. And I've decided, Martin, I'm becoming a Crusaders fan. I don't have a Super Rugby team. Oh, here we I go. was a Blues fan, here and then they go. just turned me yeah. off with their arrogance right. over the last couple they of years. They don't want you, Never being they able to back you. up You live there. in the North Island, they don't want you. Yeah, they don't, well, they don't care. They'd never be able to like back The mainstream media back up won't ever talk. say anything nice about Winston Peters. They don't care, mate. Um, but no, I'm back in the Crusaders. I'm buying one of these heritage shirts. I'm back in the Crusaders. I'm a Crusaders fan. I'm, pe- I'm jumping on the wagon while they're losing. That's a true fan. Anyway, Owen Farrell, the England rugby player, captain, has expressed a desire to play rugby for as long as possible as he left the door open to a potential England return and the chance to feature in the 2025 British and Irish Lions Tour to Australia. He's poised to become ineligible for his country for at least the next two years after agreeing a summer move to French Club Racing to, uh, 92. Racing 92. So uh, England rugby have similar rules to New Zealand where if you don't play for a club in England, you can't represent them internationally. Like what we have here, you have to play for a super rugby side to be able to play for the All Blacks. Uh, a second runner on the Olympic refugee team has been implicated in doping while preparing for the Paris Games. I probably shouldn't laugh. Uh, Dominic Lokolong Atiol. Lokolong Atio has been provisionally suspended after testing positive for trimetazidine. Trimetaz... Trimetazidine. Trimetazidine. There we go. Trimetazidine. Trimetazidine. Just say it. Just a drug that's banned, mate. Okay, that's a easier. drug that's banned. Well, there you go. Up. Track and field, uh, Track and Field's Athletics Integrity Unit has revealed this. Um, the reason I find this amusing is that it's someone doping, but they're part of the refugee team. And I think... I just find it kind of amusing that the refugee team, which probably has a lot of uh, by default fans, people are backing them, I'm sure, has, has a drug cheat amongst. I don't know. I just find that kind of uh, kind of amusing. Uh, the Wellington Phoenix women have crushed Adelaide uh, United, four uh, four nil, excuse me, uh, in Potty Doer. This was yesterday, keeping alive their A League women's playoff hopes. A sensational victory for the Phoenix, just demolishing Adelaide. Um, Apart from that, Martin, I don't really know if there's too much else going on in the world of sport today. So, that is what is making news. Devlin. You've got to love sport. The platform. F1 GP in Melbourne this weekend. What a treat to get one of the drivers on the platform this afternoon. The Finnish ace, Valtteri Bottas. Valtteri, what is it about Red Bull? What is it about that car and that driver which is so dominant at the moment? It's, uh, yeah, I think... In, in, in this sport, every now and then we see, you know, phases of domination. And now it is the Red Bull era. Uh, I think they, they have just got things right in terms of the right people, the right facilities, um, the right driver um, to drive the fastest car on, on the grid. So, yeah, I mean, they are clearly doing things um, better than, than other teams and kind of one step ahead in terms of the technical development, it seems. In terms of that, the technical development, does anyone know what it is they've actually got that nobody else has? Uh, no. no, I think if okay. everyone would know, everyone could, could try and do the same. So I think it's a combination of aero performance and uh, mechanical performance that what's under the hood. But your team must be working 24 hours a day to try and bridge that gap. Of course. I mean, this sport never stops. So everyone is always improving and uh, we made a 
really decent step from last year to this year with with completely new car and also this weekend we've got another another step into the right direction so this top is the this sport never never really stops is it frustrating knowing that max has a much faster car how do you how do you how do you overcome that in your own mind when you are racing with him you know, I, I just focus on, on on my race. That's the thing you have to do in in this sport. You don't focus on on other teams or which car they have. You try to maximize your performance, uh, your your own team's performance, and um, go from there. What is it you like about the track so much? I I like that it's it's quite technical. And nowadays, actually, with the track modifications that happened a couple of years ago, it's it's fast. It's quite a high speed track, and now it's better for racing as well. So it's yeah, that technical and high speed aspect I, I really enjoy. Valtteri Bottas is with us. You won ten GPs. Just walk us through the feeling when you cross the finish line to the checkered flag. What does that feel like? Hmm. Um, if you're winning, yeah, obviously it's a it's a awesome awesome feeling and uh, something you always miss um if you're not getting getting that result but uh it's it's quite hard to describe because it's obviously so much work goes into it and since actually that you're a small small kid you know you you start dream, dreaming about it and when it actually happens it's kind of surreal i was trying to think maybe it's like scoring a winning goal in a football match or something but that's just an isolated moment because it involves as you say all the preparation and the hours and and then the actual drive itself yeah. so yeah it'd be well i mean i don't know maybe it's like a tour de france win or something like that yeah yeah it's pretty pretty big deal at least for me so. 67 podiums 20 pole positions and your 10 gps it's a hell of a career so far for you isn't it when you actually stack those figures up I try to step back every now and then and look at the big picture. And yes, it's been it's been hell of a ride so far. But uh, I, I still feel like there's plenty more to come in the future, in, in the in the coming years. And I still have lots to achieve, lots to give for the sport. So that's the main thing on my mind. What is the essential? I've got a couple more questions. We thank you so much for your time. Um, uh, what is the essential difference when you've gone from Williams to Mercedes and now to Stake F1, a uh, team kick Sauber? What are what are the essential differences between the teams, or just in terms of personnel, amount of work done, the science? Is it quite similar? It's uh, there's there's always a difference between different teams. So being now on my third um, third racing team uh, in Formula One, it's uh, yeah obviously cultural difference um yeah amount of people varies between the teams so yeah bigger teams tend to have more more people um facilities they're always a bit different and and the working mindset can be a bit bit different so it's always hard to say like uh well yeah i mean normally you prefer the team that is the fastest that's how it goes but i'm really enjoying working with this team and um now just what we need is uh, is better results have you personally, do you feel like you've improved as a driver and that all of the other drivers are, say, better than they were even four or five years ago? Yeah, yeah. It's a bit like with the technology and teams in, in this sport. The drivers also, you need to stay on top of your game. You need to keep keep improving and learning from every year some, something new to, to perform. And being Finnish, of course, you've just got such a rich history in that country, not of only the F1, but the rally driving as well. It must be really inspirational. Yeah, I would say Finland is, is a big motorsport country, you know, and not just Formula One, but yeah, when it comes to rallying, you know, motocross, snowmobile, you name it. Everyone loves the speed, loves the, the rush. And yeah, like for me, when I was following F1, when I was doing go-karting in the 90s, I always had heroes that I could look up to and that motivated me me a lot. Who's your favourite driver then? Favourite? Oh, obviously, Mika Hakkinen. He, he, was the, he was the man. Uh, and you, you know, we can't talk to you without, you know, your Instagram is fabulous. And that footage of you, the slow-mo, where you're in the VB Speedos running past, I just laugh out loud every time I see that. It's brilliant. It's, it's so good. <laughs> Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's, you know, I think I've learned not to take myself too seriously and have some fun, fun with it. I think that's a bit easier way to live than being, being too serious on, on certain things. You also, have, you, enjoy it. you also have a New Zealand connection, finally, don't you? Because you like to come here and cycle. Yeah, that's right. With, uh, not uh, this summer, but the one before. Um, they actually, for the first time, they both... Both islands of, of New Zealand, uh, north and south, and yeah, I've got a got a good friend who's from there, uh, Brendan Hartley. So I'll spend some time there and 
yeah, cycled around, saw a lot, so it's beautiful place. I really, really enjoyed it. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Mono Greg Martin, Triple M breakfast host out of Brisbane. Former Wallaby fullback. He's loving the Super Rugby at the moment. Why the hell wouldn't he? His Reds doing real well. But the Broncos, the Brisbane Broncos, up against it tonight against the Panthers. So much to talk about with Marto. Marto, I'm just copping it like a chook from the text message line here about, I, I can't believe there's so many people, you know, I've got it wrong about Latrell. I'm going into bat, not not for, for Latrell here. I'm going into bat for Abdo, who I think got it exactly right. Let's just not make too much of a mountain of a molehill out of this thing. Exactly. I'm, I'm with you, mate. Don't worry. It was our radio station. It was one of my mates who held the microphone. And I said to him the other day, why didn't you pull it away? He said, I don't know. It was after the match. Didn't really matter. Now they're up. Do you know Channel 9 are up Triple M, which is my radio station, um, going, oh, who said you could film? I went, oh, well, who said we couldn't? Anyway, so they're up that. But five F words and a, and a shit, or, and an SH word, sorry, um, and not one complaint. Um, which means that adults are listening to the radio, not little children. So who cares? Play on, back to first tackle. Look, also, when you look, when it's edited, it sounds like worse, you know, because it just goes F, F, F. But when you listen to it in its entirety, he's obviously very frustrated at the way that his team is playing, and they are playing badly. And he says a few things, and then he kind of realises at the end, and I think gets a bit embarrassed, and he sort of throws that comment away, oh, God, oh, yeah, kids are watching, let's say, oh, I don't really care, or some of that. But I actually, I actually think, I actually think it's the reverse. I think that that's him acknowledging, oh, I have done wrong here. But I mean, in, in all, you know, in the gra- grandest scheme of things, to suspend him for that, I just think, look, we're right. It's the same as the MMA uh, to me, Greg. We're asking these guys who are hundred and something kilos to bash the living snot out of each other for eighty minutes like gladiators, and then within thirty yeah. seconds to be normal and calm. And and occasionally oh, one of them says something like this. It's like when Israel, you know, Alasanya says something out, outrageous after a fight. You can't have it both ways. Either don't interview them, or or just expect every now and again you're going to get an emotional reaction, which is all it was to me. All right, I reckon I was working on Fox Sports when we invented the walk off at half time interview. That right. is the most useless, useless thing. Yes, ever. And now everyone does it. But it's in your commercial agreement. Oh, we pay you uh, the Super Rugby. We pay you this much money. Therefore, you must allow us to have a, par- a, a player for 30 seconds as they walk off the field at half time. Have you ever heard one useful thing come out of a footballer's mouth before they go and the coach tells them what happened? They have no idea. They just know what the score is. But apart from that, usually they've got no idea what happened because they're concentrating on getting belted or belting people. We're trying to make our footballers, uh, more of our footballers, than what really is. And as I say once before, once again, I will say, if you are making a footballer a role model for your child, I need to come around and take your children from you. Yeah, that's, I totally, I absolutely agree with you, mate. Okay, hey, listen, listen really closely to that sound there. Listen to that sound. What, yeah. That's about as much chance have you got as beating Penrith tonight. I know. Mate, I'm not going to argue with this. Um, It's dreadful. No pain, Haas. No. No, don't, no, Adam Reynolds. No, no chance. No, mm. no. I, I'd love to say anything's possible, and after the round one, it was. But no, Penrith is the real deal. And, I don't know. Oh well. Do you, do, do, what do you want me to say? What of the Broncos? The Broncos and Broncos fans. Have you got over the fact that you choked on yourselves during that grand final? No, have you? Oh, you wouldn't know what's been going on. Kevy Walters. Uh, we, I just spoke to his son about an hour ago. Billy, the hooker. Um, what's happened out of the Broncos? Because Kerry doesn't said you cannot. They said we're sick to death of hearing about the grand final and our choking. So anyone who mentioned last week, <laughs> last year's grand final and training this week, there was a twenty dollar fine. Apparently, Kevy had to throw in a hundred. So he's the only one who mentioned it, and he's the one who brought in the fine. Anyway, but, but I would walk at that and go. That'd be motivating, wouldn't it? To watch the grand final and go. God, we were 18 minutes away. Yeah, right, oh, well, we yeah. now know what to do. He's saying we watched it once and then we've moved on. I don't know. At least, your Reds, do at least your Reds are doing you proud, mate. I mean, you're at the, oh, I mean that, that, oh, that team That team is the best Australian team right now. I know that, you know, you'll eventually play the Brumbies and, and I guess that's your own sort of mini grand final. But right now, mate, even here in New Zealand, everyone's looking at your Reds and going, yeah, wow, you're legit. You beat the Chiefs, mate. Mate, strong up front and playing a great style of rugby with lots of offloads amongst the yeah. boards and, yeah. and defending. You know what? And here you go. Don't, I'm not plugging the radio show, but we had Fraser McRide on, 
Who's the oh, he was the guy. Anyway. So, of course, oh. he was the guy. So, you wear part of his Australian kit because your you tight ass son wouldn't That's give you a Christmas right. present, just took one wouldn't of his give mates. Me a Christmas present. Yeah. So, I had Fraser on, and I put a theory to him, and he partially agreed. I said, because the Wallabies were knocked out so early in the World Cup, we came home early, which allowed them to have their, you know, their registered six weeks holiday, and they came back to training, and he said, so true. We Wallabies, and there's like eight or nine Wallabies in that, in that uh, red state. We've never had a full pre-season, off-season pre-season, and we're so bit at the moment. So that's why their defence is so good. That's why their they're attack's good, because they're not failing under, um, under physical frailties. They're not failing technical skills because they're, they're not fit enough. So there you go. There's a there's a good thing to come out of the Wallabies World Cup mm-hmm. disaster. I'm telling you, I like look. The, you know, do do your players have to rest every five games like our guys? No, no. What? They don't. What do you mean? Um, no, they've got to have all they've got in their collective bargain. I think it's six weeks off a year. They've got to have that six weeks off like when they come back for a Wallaby tour or when your Super Rugby season. My my grief is even if you're not on the Wallabies, when the Super Rugby season finishes in May, June, whatever it is, um, they take their six weeks then which is in the club season. That's when they should be going back and playing bloody yeah, club footy and teaching all the youngsters, bringing yeah. them through as well. The tight five. Five separate sporting topics, locked on roughly a minute or so on each. When the bell goes ding like that, <laughs> like, not like that, you dickhead. Jeez, what are you doing? I'm just saying like that. We move quickly on to the next topic. Broncos Panthers tonight. <laughs> you don't even give yourself a hope, do you? Um... I don't know. Yeah, no, I do. No, I do. Latrell's F bomb. Let's talk a bit more about that. Because I, again, again, people, I just want to say I, I'm not. I'm not saying it was the right thing to do or anything. I just think the right thing to do was not to suspend him because of it. RTS says he's not going back to fullback. He wants to stay at centre. He said the coach is going to decide. Despite everyone calling for him to go back to fullback, or well, not everyone. Jared Warrior Hargraves is playing his 300th game. Well, he'd better start running like he didn't do last weekend against Manly because he looked like a pudding when he came on the field, I thought. Uh, Patrick Tui Paluto is playing his 100th game for the Blues. Well, obviously, not a lot of confidence in the locking stocks in New Zealand if Razor wants Sam Whitelock back. Um, and the most disappointing New Zealand sporting loss for you of all time in your youthful time on this planet, Lachlan. Let us talk to start with, though, about the Broncos and the Panthers because, once again, the NRL get it exactly right. The bugger about this game, though, is the players that are missing. And when you're missing Reynolds and when, when you're missing Flegler and when you're missing Payne House, I, I look, as much as I despise the Broncos and I hate Hazlan, I really like watching this guy play. Even though I've always hated Hazlan, there are several Queensland players I've always liked watching. Like Gordon Tallis is one of them. I, I could I could watch that guy every day. Mm. And I love what Payne House brings. Just well, that he's, a, he's, a, he's a New ball. South Welshman, but yeah, no, I, I give you so. But it's just, just the physicality, the unstoppable force that he is. The fact that when he gets the ball, everyone must be afraid, and he's going to hurt you. He's going to make meters, right? He's yeah. the best player in the world on his day, I think. I think he is. He's, well, he's certainly the most influential. Every team in the world that plays rugby league wants that guy. Well, the thing is, and I, 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 I I'm resisting bringing it up because there is open wounds of pain and pain and pain. But in the grand final last year... How many fights you up? 27, 22... Stop it. You're up 18. Just, you're up, stop. There were five minutes to go. Let, you let, there were let three me minutes address. to go. You are up eight points. Did mm. you choke worse than the Warriors? Don't you... Don't don't compare us to that You team. did, didn't don't you? Don't compare us you to... You choked a, worse than the, the Warriors? The, the joke of the club oh, here that we go. the Warriors oh, are. Oh, here we go. What do the Warriors have to show... Oh, stop it. No. I tell anyway. you what the Warriors have got to show. At the end of the weekend, they're going to be one and two, just like you guys. Stop it. Anyway, let me just... In the grand final, Ezra Mam scored a hat trick, and had we held on and won the game, he probably would have been the god of the Clive Church medal because he scored three tries. Payne Haas was a monster in that game. Payne Haas was without a doubt the reason in that second half we had that spurt of performance. I'm talking about tonight. I'm just saying that without him, we're not the same. Now you brought up Tom Flegler, who's obviously not even on our team anymore, is at the Dolphins now. So not having him and Haas is just horrendous. Uh, Jock Matt and I actually think he's a handy little halfback. He's not as good as Adam Reynolds, but as a replacement, he's not bad. Um, but we're going to get Eden up in the middle. Uh, we're going to. I'm, I'm predicting a 36-8, 36-10 loss. We've got no hope. I'm chalking this. I, I, I tell you what, I, I'd consider just getting home from the pub after quiz night and just going to bed. Oh, you're a sad man. I can't watch my teams lose. 
I can't because I yell at the TV, I throw cushions across the room, I bang my head on the couch. I can't do it. Go to quiz night, go to bed and just send her a little texty wexty after last night. No Stop, Stop it. Stop it. Uh, Sam Whitelock, is this for real? And are you in favour of it? Uh, no, uh, it's, no, it's no disrespect at all to Sam Whitelock, but I'm not in favour of it at all. I am. Do you know why? Because I'll go back to the argument that me and Watto put forward every single Tuesday. I don't care about the World Cup in Australia in 2027. I'll care about that in 2027. What I want right now is the All Blacks to re-establish themselves as the team that every time you play, you lose. Every time, every game, you lose. And that's what Razor's got to get that back. You get that back, that's the platform to start from. And if Sam Whitelock can compete at that level again, or he can provide cover, or he can provide whatever it is that Razor needs him to provide to the young locks. At the moment, Lachlan, we don't have anyone. Scott Barrett's injured. If Scott Barrett's not playing, pick the two all-black locks, and they are B-division locks in international rugby is yeah, what they yeah, are. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree with that. I think my my issue is it's a little bit... It's like the issue I had with the Lakers in the last sort of year or two with Kobe Bryant, which it's a bit different because... You know, just the status and the legendariness of Kobe was so big that he deserved a spot on that team right up until he wanted uh, when he wanted to retire. <laughs> I just don't. I don't think it benefits the future of the All Blacks. I want to win every test. Um, I'm just like you. Now, how long has Sam Whitelock got left playing at a high level and actually being a serviceable lock? For the All Blacks, if he was to come back, because last year he oh, didn't, a couple of mate, uh, I, I tell you three what, three or four games. Yeah, though. last year he played, um, didn't play every test. He, he was giving like, especially in the World Cup, the group phase and the knockout phase, he sort of had this rotation with Brody. Yeah, he Brody came off the bench, yeah. Where he'd come off the bench in the next test, Brody would come off That's the bench. Right. The next test, it was That's Whitelock. Right. So right. there was a workload thing, a workload managing thing going on there. So if he was to come back now, if it was in a mentoring sort of coaching almost role. Yeah, I'd, 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 I'd adore that, absolutely. But if it's playing, I, I just think it takes away an opportunity from a player. Look, we can sit here and complain about the locking stocks. There's only one way to improve them. Give these guys yeah, these minutes. Guys, okay, sure. All right. So I would rather I like actually... The way that, I like the way that Rose is thinking, though. I, just, I, I do too. Bring him back as an assistant coach or maybe some sort of mentoring oh, camp. Do that. That's what I think is better. Latrell's F-bomb. Plenty of texts on this, and I'm sorry that I haven't got to them all, but I'll, I'll, I'll go back through the texts. Um, and, and there's uh, very polarising. Plus, uh, you're either pro or anti this. Look, again, I, to me, it was dumb and stupid of him to do that. And after he dropped the first run, he probably knew, already knew. I mean, the first run sometimes can slip out, an mm. F-bomb can slip out. But once you've done it twice or you've done it three times, you know you're saying it. And at that stage, he should be adult enough to stop. I don't think, though, that he's that much of an adult, Latrell Mitchell. Um, the way that he just emotionally reacts to everything and, 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 and nuts off... Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not condemning him for this because, you know, I've lived my whole life like that. And especially in your 20s, you can't ask him to be a wise, mature man when he's 22 or 23 years old because he's not. He understands his responsibilities. And that was very clear with the way that he climbed into the debate over Spencer Leno and what Leno said to Ezra Mam, right? So, yeah, you know, he's... And, and he knows that when he talks, a lot of people are going to be watching and listening to what he says because he does polarise people and people will jump all over him. Here's a guy that was called on the field a black dog or something, I think it was last year. Last year, was yeah. it around, like, around this time last year, yep. You know, and so he's just, I believe at the end of a game, he's got a kaleidoscope of emotions going on in his head. He should never let himself slip like that and it won't happen again I believe if it happens again he's got to get suspended no question but I kind of think sometimes what happens in these situations is that the bad becomes good Lachlan and that Spencer Lenu there won't be another player makes a racist insult this year on the field I guarantee it right no I agree and I don't think anyone's going to F-bomb after what Latrell did either no, neither incident should have happened. It's, it, but it, at the end of it, do you really come down with a hammer and suspend a guy for that? I'm not so sure. I want to keep suspensions for acts of foul play on the field or things like the race, racist I think, comment. I think if this is the first time it's happened, which by the sounds of it, it is the first time it's happened, then yeah, I, I, I like a one-time warning saying, just don't do that again, please. Like, but then, if he does it a second time, then I well, he has I, to get su suspended. Yeah, I'd yeah. suspend him. He's got to be suspended. I guess my look. I don't, I'm, I'm like you as well. But when you when you when you hear that audio, it doesn't sound good. No, it at doesn't. It all. doesn't. It doesn't. sounds really look, tell bad. You what, and it's not a great Triple M aren't, con aren't complaining. It's the best advertising that they oh, have. They yeah, but for, for the NRL, they're thinking. Yeah, well, they want to clean up the act and clean exactly. up the sport. Mate. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Um, RTS says he's not going to go back to fullback. 
I Disagree. don't know. I don't, I think that I think I would put a dollar ten on the fact that he plays at fullback in in some capacity in some game for the Warriors this year. Oh yeah, I think so as well. Whether he gets selected to play there right from the start, I'm not so sure. I wouldn't even be surprised about well, that. We said this. We talked about this. I, I think we were sort of onto this quite early on. After the first game. Well, no, we were onto this before that. I, we, uh, I remember I, myself saying it, and I think you agreed with me, that, and this was in pre-season, that your spine, your four players in the spine, your hooker, your halves, and then your fullback, are your four... Best players. Best, well, best players, but most potent playmakers, if that makes sense. So you want guys in those positions with the most dangerous games yes. as a runner, yes. as a stepper, Get your as, hands as on the ability ball. to get through yep. the line, yep. whether it's yep. a kicking game, passing, whatever it is. And in my opinion, Roger has all of those facets of his game at a higher level than, not no disrespect, than Chance Nicol Klukstar. And Chance has played well in the centres before, played there for Canberra the last couple of years. He was there. He's a good footballer. I like the idea of Roger being at fullback and Chance being in the centres more so than the other way around. And yeah. I thought that's what they should have done before the season started. Devastating sporting losses for New Zealand sporting teams. A lot of people say the 2019 One Day Cricket World Cup final. The, the semi-final defeat on this day in 1992, for me, was even worse. Because in 2019, I thought we were lucky getting through to the final. I thought it was such a we bonus that lucky. we were in the final, right? Yeah. In 1992, genuinely in that semi-final, the whole country believed that it wasn't hope, it was real. It was real. Yeah. She's coming back to me. She loves me, Lachlan. She might have left and rooted my best friend, but she's coming back because she loves me. And and no, no, she no, no, she ended up back no. with her best friend. So. Well, for me, I saw a post from a uh, I'll just say a rival radio. Oh, they're not really a rival of ours, but a radio station in New Zealand, um, and they listed four pillars of New Zealand sporting. Excuse my French shitters. And number one, they had that 2019. World Cup loss, the Cricket World Cup loss. Second was the 2007 quarterfinal. Third was the America's Cup loss in 2013. Oh yeah, that was that's bad. a good one. For yeah. David Tua versus Lennox Lewis, which shocked me because I don't, I wasn't, um, no, I was, I was no, three years old. He was never going to win that's that the fight. Thing. He was Who never thought winning? that no one, David Tua was no going to win that? Gonna, With no, all due respect no, to David no, Tua, no, 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 David making the final, making that heavyweight championship bout final was was yeah. his, was his win. Now for me. Now, I started really watching a lot of sport in 2000 and probably five or six. Like, my earliest memory watching rugby was Lottie Takiri speed tackling Richie McCall in a test match. Uh, I was sort of a late bloomer to sport, uh, except for motorsport. Most devastating, um, not, I can't say 2007 because I wasn't that developed. No, plus, with the All Blacks, the All Blacks were always coming back. You knew that they were going to win yeah, eventually. Yeah, but that hurt. But I, I, I just remember sitting there kind of being a bit numb to it because that was also Bathurst Day and my favourite driver, Craig Lowndes, won that day. I remember that. Gorgeous, sunny day in Auckland. Uh, but I just, I wasn't so immensely engrossed in my fandom. Um, now, does it have to be a New Zealand team? Yeah. Oh, okay, I was going to say the Broncos in 2015. That'll do, mate. The Broncos in 2015 will do it. Todd Blackadder, the legendary Crusaders and Canterbury captain. And then, of course, he coached the Crusaders. He was a botched refereeing penalty decision away from winning a Super Rugby title and probably would have stayed on a few more years, but he was replaced by Razor who's been replaced by Rob Penny, and Rob Penny pretty much in the same boat that Todd Blackadder found himself in, which is, you're meant to be winning and winning every week. How do the Crusaders dig themselves out of this 0-4 hole? Todd Blackadder. Have you called your mate Rob Penny? Because he's not off to a great start. Oh, he's not off to a great start, and I don't think um, you know, all of the, that is his doing, really. I think he's sort of walked into a perfect storm, but... The one thing I think everyone knew that this was going to be a, a difficult season for for all the right reasons, you know, a lot of a massive change and a young coaching staff and a new era and those things. And you know, Rob Penny is a really experienced coach and he's got a, he's in a great organisation. And I don't put it all down to him; he'll be doing his very best to get things on track. But I think he's probably walked into a perfect storm with a lot of injuries and a bit of a limited pre-season running into the season really couldn't build those combinations that he's probably looking for. And, hey, the one thing is um, they've got people that really care in that team and they've got a, still got a lot of experience in there and they'll be working really hard behind the scenes to get things back on track. And one thing I'd never do is write off a, an angry red and black organisation. So uh, I think there's a lot of good things that will come out of this and they'll be building a lot of resilience and, um, and it's still early days. Yeah, and Marshy said that to us on Monday. He said, well, what say, what say 
They make seventh or eighth spot. Who wants to play them in a quarter final when you're the one or two seed? Yeah, I think, um, you know, with a young side, I think, you know, it's different when you're watching a lot of experience and those older guys do it and now it's their time. And I think that there's still good lessons learnt and there's still a lot of experience there and they've got really, you know, they'll know the the processes and they'll have the work ethic and they just need to find their feet a little bit and there's a long way to go. And while everyone's sort of focusing on the Crusaders, you'd have to say that a lot of those other teams haven't really got their complete package together either. You know, I think everyone's looked a little bit vulnerable at times and even, you know, um, pre-season favourites, the Chiefs, still got rolled by the Reds. Yeah, exactly right. There's still a lot of... There's still a lot of work to be done, I think, for all those super sides, and it's still early days. And as you quite rightly said, uh, Marty, you've only got to make the top eight, and you know by then they'll have a lot of players coming back from injury. And and if anything, you know, like um, for the Crusader boys, this has been done before. They've been in in similar situations, and they've managed to work their way out of it. I, I kind of feel it's almost part of the DNA, isn't it? That and it's not like you want to be in this position, but you don't mind being written off. Here's a stat for you, mate. Uh, uh, Tom Christie is the only player that started last week against the Hurricanes who started the final last year against the Chiefs. So when it comes to, you know, completely rejigging your side, I'm not sure. I mean, you know, people are looking at this Crusaders team assuming it's the same side. But, I mean, that says absolutely and utterly it's not. Yeah, it's not. And, um, you know, those the combinations, they, they actually take time. And, you know, if you look at the preseason, they didn't, you know, they came back from that Northern Tour and one thing about the Northern Tour is you, know, you just lose preparation days, you know, when you're flying and travelling and, you know, trying to recover from jet lag and those things. And it probably wasn't ideal. And, you know, Rob Penny never really set that up uh, for his pre-season. He sort of inherited that. And then he's sort of walked into the perfect storm almost. But w- when you talk about players and experience, you know, there's there's players that have been involved with that organisation, even though that they may not have started. And when you look at... Yeah, the current captain through injury, David Harvilli, he's been you know, he's been there for you know, eight or nine seasons. And then you've got the likes of Ryan Crotty, who's uh, you know, he's well over played over a hundred games, and so is Joe Moody. There's still and there's some, you know, some raw talent there. You know, I really like some really really encouraging signs from some of those young guys. You know, so you know, they're taking a little bit on the chin at the moment, but I tell you what, you know, they'll they'll come back even stronger for this and best to get the lessons learnt now. And um yeah, one thing about the organisation, they'll always pull together. And I think probably, if anything, just to block out all the external noise and just focus on, on themselves and get back to that that sort of like that winning DNA. And I think this week's a really good challenge. Yeah, yeah. It's probably the longest, the longest turnaround they've had so far to prepare for a side, you know. So I think, you know, they had a little bit of breathing space and they'll be better prepared for uh, what's going to come on Saturday night up at Eden Park. Todd Black had a, with us out of Japan. Yeah, losing Scott Barrett was a hell of a blow, I thought, for the weeks he's out as well. Todd, just in terms of that, what you're saying about the Crusaders' way, I mean, you're immersed in this, and it's something that none of us understand unless you're actually in it. But, you know, it goes deep, doesn't it? There's a mentoring system. There's alumni. There's a lot of people around you that can offer damn good advice and calm the farm. I think so, and I think that you know what that comes out of. You know, like the the Crusader leadership, the, the players themselves really drive the accountability. You know, they really they really drive that themselves, and they work along with their coaches to to not only you know whether it's the drills or you know the the type of training and the focuses that they need and the changes they need to make. They all work collaboratively together to, to I suppose to get aligned and um, they'll all be feeling those pressures but the one thing they will do is they'll always look internally and take responsibility for everything and I think that that's what comes out of really good leadership and you know the leadership gets passed down to the next generation and, and that's a, a culture where they all try to help each other and we've seen glimpses of that yeah you know, just that work ethic last week and now it's just time for them to just keep focusing on the simple things that they do well and just keep getting better at them. And, you know, they've got a lot of experience to come back into the side as well. And obviously losing Scott Barrett was a, a massive blow because he he was just outstanding in those first couple of rounds. And, you know, they've got the likes of Cody Taylor and, and those boys coming back into the mix. So, you know, they've got a lot of experience to come back in. But also, too, those players will still be working with them currently within their environment to get them back on track. But they'll always have the full support of 
all the ex-players and the whole organisation and, and the Crusader support will always be behind them because that's when you actually need it. You need it through the tough times. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. Ryan Fox, always a treat to have Ryan on the programme. That hole-in-one TPC Sawgrass over the weekend, pretty much as good as it gets for him so far this year on the PGA Tour. He's played in five tournaments. He's missed the cut three times. So what's just what's just not going well with the game at the moment? It can turn around quick as. When does he feel his swing is coming back? Ryan. What do you put it down to? Because, again, I mean, in all of these tournaments, and we saw it at Sawgrass as well, you're hitting some great shots. In that first round, I thought it was excellent, and then it just, you know, just kind of slipped away. Yeah, it's, last week was a funny one. I got a virus on uh, Thursday um, and sort of woke up Friday morning with really sore hands and feet, feeling lethargic and lightheaded, and that's not a golf course you want to be feeling like that on, and I just didn't have it on Friday, and... It was a bit disappointing because I actually I came off Thursday. Obviously, I had a, a couple of pretty incredible shots on Thursday. But, you know, my, my back nine, which was the front nine, I felt like I had a lot of really good shots and, you know, felt like I was starting to find something. And then, you know, it just kind of disappeared completely on, on Friday, not feeling myself. And, you know, came into this week, you know, feeling like I was back at square one a little bit. What do you do in those circumstances? Do you go back onto the driving range? How is it best for you to get over or get through it? Uh, yeah, I've just been working hard, just trying to find a couple of feelings to take out onto the golf course. And there's certainly been some positive stuff over the last few weeks. Um, you know, I had a really nice last round at, at the Cognizant um, in West Palm and obviously you know, a, a decent first round at the players. Um, and I just... It's just been one of those trips so far. I just haven't been able to put it all together. You know, I've had signs of it. Mm. Um, you know, I've had a couple of good rounds. I've had rounds where something's gone really well and then everything else kind of hasn't worked. Um, yeah, I've had, you know, rounds where I felt like I played okay and couldn't score. It's, you know, it just seems like golf is, is getting me at the moment. And, you know, I've had a pretty good couple of years and just – Unfortunately, it just feels like at the moment it's I've picked a bad time to have a little bit of a downturn, and hopefully I can turn it around pretty quick. What a bastard of a game it is, isn't it, eh? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. And you know, there's <laughs> it's been tough travel wise this year. You know, oh yeah, I've had the family. There's yep. been some uncertainty schedule wise. You know, traveling with two kids has been great, but that's pretty hard. And um, you know, kind of not knowing where you're going and everything new and trying to learn golf courses, you know, you put it all together and there's a whole bunch of little things that, that the comfort level's not quite there like it is in Europe. And, you know, all of that stuff can just equate to being a little bit off. And when you're playing against the best players in the world, week in, week out, you don't have to be very far away from it to, to look a little silly. And, you know, the golf courses we play are pretty brutal as well. And it's the same thing. You know, you hit good shots and you get punished pretty quickly and you get bad shots and, and you get punished really badly. And that's kind of what's, happened to me um you know this this trip you know it, it hasn't been that far away but it's just been far enough away that i i haven't been able to score and yeah look all it's going to take is one good day to, ch to change the whole complexion of it one good week and i'll be i'll be up and running and i know that's pretty close ryan fox is with us good old catch up after the tbc sawgrass and a hit of temper Telf was asking yesterday he said ask ryan he said are the courses particularly harder or than than the europe ones or or or, or how are they different um they're, they're definitely a little bit harder um you've from what i've seen over here you've got a bit more length um, the fairways are, I don't know if they're narrower, but the penalty for missing fairways is a bit more severe over here. The roughs generally um, up a lot more off the fairway. Um, around the greens, the roughs really nasty, and the greens are generally firmer and faster than what we play in Europe week in, week out. And, you know, you get that, and, you know, it's really easy to make bogey out here. You know, you all you got to do is miss a green and, you know, you get a bad lie around the green and all of a sudden you hit it to 15 foot and you make bogey and you walk off and you go, well, I didn't really feel like I did a whole lot wrong there. You know, I, I was just off. And, you know, it's, I think it's just the nature of these courses with everything I've played so far has been pretty tricky and um, I don't really expect that to change. So, you know, I've just got to be a bit more precise with things. And, you know, there's definitely, I've definitely had some scores going. I just haven't been able to put it together, you know, 
not let alone four days in a row, probably even two days in a row at this point. So, yeah, hopefully I can I can piece it all together soon. So you step up to 17 at Sawgrass, and there's only been about 17 or 18 people that have dropped a hole in one. Um, that was such a gorgeous swing, mate. And when I, I mean, look, you're far away. I don't I don't know how much you can physically see from from there to the actual. But as soon as it landed. The television camera was in exactly the right position. It bit, it spun. It was so online. It was going in from the moment the moment it hit the grass. Yeah, look, I I knew straight off the bat, I'd hit a good shot. Um, you know, it's a pretty intimidating shot, regardless. You've got, um, you know, a few thousand people there, and they either want to see you do that or make <laughs> they a lot. want to see it in the water, um, right? That's the other thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's 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 no in between there. If you make one or two, they're really excited. They don't care about a three, and if you make five, six, or seven, they love seeing that too. So it's always nice when you when you you know it feels good off the club face, and you look up and it's going to be dry. And I knew straight off the bat it was it was a pretty good number for me. It was a three quarter gap wedge, and when I when it landed, I thought this has got a chance. Um, and you know, I've probably I've said it multiple times in the last couple of years. You know, you hit a good shot on a par three, and it looks right down the barrel. Like, oh, that might have a chance. And you know, most of the time it never goes close, or it's you know half a club out here and there. And when that one landed and came back down a slope, to see it go in was was pretty cool. And you know, regardless of how last week finished up, you know, having a hole in one on 17 is is pretty cool to to have on the career highlight reel. To hear the full interview, download the platform at the App Store. Via Platform Plus, you can go back and listen to the whole show and all of the interviews in full. We need to talk. I know. We I know. need I know. to talk. I realise that. It's called What Is More Chance of Happening? Next! Where I give you two scenarios, Lock, and you tell me out of the two what is more chance of happening. The Broncos gain revenge for the grand final choke tonight against the Panthers or... Or the Crusaders beat the Blues on Saturday night. The Crusaders what? beat the Blues. I'm putting money on that. The Crusaders own the Blues. Apart from that match in 2022 in Christchurch, which was cancelled out by the fact that, and one upped by the fact the Crusaders won the final in Auckland and just absolutely rolled the yeah, Blues. They did. I was they did. there, I was they at the game. They did. They did. Uh, the Blues don't beat the Crusaders. They I, just I, never I just, beat them. I've got this feeling that the Crusaders will win this game. I don't know why. What is more chance happening? Your Broncos overcome all the odds. Why are you to... laughing? Why are you laughing? Because I'm we loving it. the grand final last okay, year. Okay, because at the end of it, you're going to be one and two like the Warriors are. Your Broncos beat the Panthers tonight or... I hope the Warriors lose this weekend. My goodness. What is more chance of happening? That the Broncos get revenge tonight or the Blues Crusaders on Saturday night at Eden Park gets a bigger crowd than the Waratahs versus the Raiders in Christchurch. What is more chance of happening? Oh, Oh, say it. <laughs> um, I think Blues Crusaders should get 20,000. At least. It, well, I would hope at least gets 15. Oh, it's what, 17 in Christchurch for the Warriors. That's the capacity, isn't it? Tell you what, though. No, you don't really hear about it or see anything around town about no, it. No, you don't. There's, there's, no, there's, there's no, no little promotion. There's, there's nothing. There's no little flags on flagpoles. No, no, there's nothing. What we call bunting, there's none of that, is there? Yeah, there's no ads on TV. What is more chance of happening? I mean, I don't watch TV, but... Um, I, I, I'm going to say... Mm. Oh, I don't know. I really don't know. Can I say both? No, you got to make it to the game is about what is more chance of happening. <sighs> okay, I'm going to say it. There's more chance that the Broncos beat the Panthers. <laughs> yes! <laughs> what is more ch- I, I, don't, I just... I don't... Like, the Blues Crusaders could get more and should... But I, it's just more that you, I just don't... Like, I wouldn't know what's on unless I did this job. What is more chance of happening? The Broncos beat the Panthers in Penrith tonight or Bottas v, beats Verstappen and... Oh, OK. I look... I'm now I'm now Valtteri's biggest fan. Yes. Because he and his team answered the phone call. Yes. Come but on, you, come on, you I, Botto. I, if he said that he gets a top 10 finish, I'd go with that. Absolutely. OK, podium finish. No, he won't get a podium. Hey, um. yes. uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for him in the, in the way... I mean, he's one of the best drivers, but he's in one of the worst teams. That's how motorsports... Well, that's how Formula 1 really works, is that you can be one of the best drivers, but if you don't have the car, you're not going to get a podium. What is more chance of happening? Next! The Broncos gain revenge on the Panthers tonight for your grand final capitulation last year. Or yes, can you just say loss? Do, or, you, do you have to say capitulation? Or at some time in the next three years, the mainstream media here <laughs> publish something positive 
about the democratically elected government of this country. What is more chance of happening? See, you're leaning I'd towards say the, the second one. No, I'd say the second one. You think? There, there'll be one point, surely, between in the next two and a half years that the mainstream media produces a positive article about the government. Haven't surely. yet. Well, it's only been since October. I'm sure there'll be one. On what least. channel? It won't be on television New Zealand. It won't maybe be something stuff. on ZB about us getting out of a recession, maybe. Actually, if yeah, that happens. Mike Hosking's mainstream media, and he's actually a supporter of the yeah. democratically elected government. Good point. What is more chance of happening? Just quickly, the Panthers are ten and a half point favourites. <laughs> ten and a half. Look at from Toby. What happens? The Broncos win or the sun comes up tomorrow? What is more chance of happening? Thank you, Toby. <sighs> the yes. sun rises in the east tomorrow morning, guaranteed. What is more chance of happening, Lachlan? Your Broncos, after <clears throat> gobbing and gagging on the final last year, Overcome that hurt and shamed disappointment. What, what, what team did we beat to get to the grand final? Well, they did. They, we were we were thirty points underdogs exactly. in that game. So and you we have lost. no place to say hey, anything. We were thirty points now, underdogs. Now, if you were a Panthers fan, listen to this. Lady. If you're a Panthers See, fan, to, he I'd absolutely give get you. Get over it, mate. It's just a game. It's just a game. It's just a game. What is more you're chance? You're her. You sound like her. What is more chance? Why don't you just support a different team that wins? She never said that to you, did she? How did? What did you say? How idiotic. And she said, you're no, idiots. No, <laughs> that, no, there was once when it was when the Broncos got killed by the Storm by like 60 points a couple of years ago. And I got told, uh, not it's just a game, but oh, at least just turn it off. You're getting worked up. Yeah, because we're losing and getting dicked. That's why I'm getting worked up. I'm getting more worked up because you're saying I'm getting worked up. Yeah, yeah. I love that one where they say, oh, you're in a bad mood. No, I'm not. But I am now. 1992. Go back in your life to that absolute devastation of when you had your heart broken for the first time. And you just, you lose a little something, don't you? You don't want to trust again. You don't want to, you don't want to open yourself up to the possibility that that could again happen to you. I think that's what a lot of cricket fans in New Zealand felt the summer of love, 1992. Oh my God, the Black Caps were winning every single game. Oh my God, we're going to make the final. 262, nobody chases down 262. And then Inzaman came in, hit 60 off 37 balls. I can feel the pain as real today as it was 32 years ago. Danny Morrison was part of that team. 32 years ago today, mate, where were you? 32 years ago? Well, yeah, I got married 31 years ago, so I better not get that wrong. Um, <laughs> but no, um, we had a World Cup on, didn't we? Yeah. Didn't we? Yeah. yeah, we did. It was the World Cup in New Zealand. New Zealand. Yep. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Loved it. That was at Eden Park, and today was the semi final. It's Inzaman Day. Mm. Didn't he play well? My God. But the more I look at that, people go, Jesus, you know, this, this guy played out of, and he did, he played out of his skin. And I think about Imran Khan, and you're like this too, Marty D. Well, the, planet, the planet's lined up beautifully for Pakistan to win that. They got bowled out for 72 by England and Adelaide earlier on. If they had played that game and would have lost, they wouldn't have got to a semi final. So when you look at that, then they had to beat the Aussies in Perth. Then they came to us. They beat us. I mean, we qualified, so we're a bit sort of null and void. And um, they won that game at Christchurch. That's the only game we lost in the whole round robin. And then we played them in the semi. Pa- Pakistan were the only side we lost um, to yeah. in the whole of that World Cup in right. too, wasn't it? Freaky. And the other thing was, we didn't have form going in. I think England had dicked us 3-0 in that one-day series. So, you know, that opening day, Marty Crowe's 100, Chris Harris's run out from the, you know, sidearm throw. And they were just... Man, it, it kick-started something. I called it the summer of love. God, we fell in love with cricket. Yeah, and, and I think and then that whole wonderful innovation of Dipak opening the bowling, for goodness sake, which is now, you know, there's the blueprint. You've got to have a spinner and white ball cricket usually starts, isn't he? So it was. I, I think back to that, Marty, and look at that month of our lives, and it really was of hopping around beautiful Aotearoa, um, having a, I had a great time. We had a little earthquake tremor, and I was rooming as Rod Latham freaking out there in Otomotai in Napier. And it was just a classic. It was, it was, it was so much fun. We stayed in these humble um, motels and stuff. And it really wasn't. Everyone just mucked in and had fun. Guys were running around squirty guns, blowing bubbles everywhere, and had such a great family time. Um, even though, when you think about behind the scenes, Marty, Marty um, Crow, full on how he was, we weren't even going to select him. I didn't even want him as captain in those days. It was bizarre. There was so much other 
going on. It's yeah, bizarre. the politics. It was, look, he was the best player in the world at that World Cup. No question about it, mate. I mean, he just had a, he had a wand in his hand, didn't he? Ninety one off eighty three in that final before he got injured, of course, and then he came back. At what stage? Look, when we batted and scored two sixty two back in those days, that was a hell of a total. Not many teams chased that down, if any did. It's like it's like three eighty today, I reckon. You know, throw another hundred odd on it, um, and I know. Of course, the game's evolved massively, but you're right. 261 was like getting 360, 380 today. And um, losing you're losing Crowley like that, losing your rudder of your ship, really. So um, it was tough, tough on righty, um, and it really was because of the idiosyncrasies of knowing when to take a guy off or look, Crowley go, I just think I've got to get him last now, or I'll bring Roddy Latham on, or I'll give, I'll, give, I'll give Harry another go and swap ends with him. So, of course, righty didn't have all that touch with that because he wasn't captain so it was frustrating mate. At what stage did you feel it was really slipping away because when Inzaman came on I mean nobody had heard of this guy and apparently didn't even want a bloody bat 60 off 37 it was one of the greatest ever one day innings. at what stage did you start to feel shite this is this is this is going bad here boys? Uh, I think when you had the great job of me and dad at the other end and he was just in so much control and to be fair Eden Park as you cricket lovers will know listening to your show well will know that it was just this brown strip and it really was a bit like Pakistan and playing on a slow shit heat for a better term. Um, and it was, and he worked it around beautifully and he found an ally. You needed someone to play that sort of hand. And don't forget Sully Mullet, dodgy old Sully Mullet got shoved down the order because Imran Khan decided to come in and bat three or whatever and, and take control. And even he batted quite slowly. Yes, he did. Uh, and so when you think about Chris Harris running out Wazi Makram at the time, you thought, hang on, we're back in the contest. But really, um, Javid was still there, and then Moen Khan came in and put the icing on the cake. They won. Marty, I, I just, isn't it funny? I just remember games. They won with an over the speed. Yeah, they did. That's, that's it. it. I mean, that's incredible. Oh, that, that, that's the crazy thing. Because you were going to bowl the final over, but you didn't get to bowl it. No, and sadly, I just bowled a little wide. I think back to that time, you know, you're trying to swing it and what have you, and I just bowled a little wide. I didn't probably have quite the repertoire. Um, I had even in the next year bowling slower balls and changes of pace coming wide a bit more and I learnt that funny enough being at Lancashire of that winter in 92 post that World Cup had an opportunity to go and fill in for the great Wazi Akram um, and that and that sort of helped shape and mould a bit more so yeah there was just you know you'd love to have done things differently but it was that time you know just that's what it was that's our podcast for today. Thank you so much for listening. If you want to listen to the entire show one till four Monday to Friday. Download the Platform app and via Platform Plus you can go back and listen to whatever shows over however many weeks at your leisure, at your listening pleasure. Platform Plus. First thing to do though is download the Platform app. Devlin. You better believe it. The Platform.